Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Grace Baptist Church. Glad there's lots of people here, and thank you for all that are watching on Facebook as well. Um, just a reminder, in the seat back, there are some welcome cards. If you're new here or relatively new here, please fill those out, put them in the offering basket, or leave them on the table. Also, if you need to update any information, um, that's a great way to do that as well. Um, if you're visiting here for the first time, we have a welcome center over here. Um, please stop in after service. We have a gift for you. Um, um, some announcements we have. Our night of prayer is this Sunday from 6 until 7. It's a great time for God's people to come together, to worship, to praise Him, and to have a scripture uh, reflection. Again, that's next Sunday from 6 to 7. Um, an email was sent out this past Thursday about an upcoming meeting for anybody interested in working with the youth. And I know there was a Google form to reply back, and I'm not that Google savvy, so I just talked to John and Tammy. If you're interested, it's a great opportunity to spend time um, sharing God's Word with our kids. Um, please contact with them, even if you don't want to do the Google form, let them know that you're interested. Um, Every Sunday morning at 9 a.m. we have Adult Sunday School. We're working through Ecclesiastes. Um, if you have any questions about that, please see Pastor Tom. And let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you for this day you've given us to gather together as your church, to worship you, to praise you, Father. We thank you for the worship time. We thank you for your word being taught, Lord. And thank you for the fellowship of this church family, Lord. Pray that you bless our time, and we ask this all in Jesus' name. Good morning. Good morning. Ask that you join us in worship. Let's stand to our feet. We have a special treat today. We have a few of our ladies that are usually on worship team. I hope they come more often. We have uh, Violet and Donna, Donna, and Bethany right here joining us. And if you'd like to be a part of the worship team in any way, we always like encourage you to come see me, even if it's not every week. We'd love to have you come sing or play, and especially you men on May 8th, on uh, Mother's Day, I'd like to see all the men up here for um, worship, so the men can sing for their ladies, <laughs> and for God, too, of course, for God. <laughs> God first, then the ladies. <laughs> So if you're interested, come and talk to me or Charlene or someone on the worship team. Right now we're going to focus our attention on our Savior, our Lord, and sing some music for Him.
just ask your blessing on this day, Lord, as we, we celebrate in your house, that we have the freedom to do that, Lord, and we ask you continue our hearts right now, Lord, that continue, put that spirit of worship in us, Lord.
Oh, Lord God, we just thank you. We thank you for your glorious presence in our lives. We thank you that we have this freedom to worship you. Lord, I just ask that our worship have been pleasing to you. Lord, even as we think about the price you paid upon that cross for our sins, Lord, we think about we've, we called, or maybe we are calling upon you at this moment to be saved, or we, or we know, Lord, the day that you did that. Lord, even as we sang that, just, re, just let us reflect in our hearts how much you love us, how perfect you are, how holy you are. And yet here we are, Lord, a, a people who are we're broken in some ways, we're, we're sinful in many ways, Lord, we're disobedient to you. But that never stops you from loving us. So Lord, we just come humbly before you this morning to worship you, to say thank you. And Lord... I think it's critical this morning that we allow you to love us. And we say, come Holy Spirit, pour down on us. We pray all of this, Jesus, in your holy and perfect name. Amen. Wow, that was really good worship. I know that. Yeah, give him a hand. So that's really exciting too. So we praise you, Lord. We praise you. So in a moment, we're going to uh, be taking up our offertory, and that is that is such a time that we're giving back to the Lord what is His, and that sometimes is a challenging time. Anytime we talk about giving, we talk about money. It is challenging, but you know what? We're focused on Almighty God, who has just simply called us to manage and hold on to what belongs to Him. And I think, isn't that a wonderful privilege that we can do that? And even as we give this morning, we know we want to give with cheerful hearts. With hearts that say, Lord, it's all about you. Lord, it's not about what I have. It's not about what I'm trying to keep. It's about what you're going to do. And even as I, as I always pray when we have the opportunity to pray for the offertory, we always give with that expectation that whatever it is that we give, God is going to do far greater things than we can even imagine. Because if we apply what He's done in each one of our lives, what He's already given us, think about what He's going to do with what we give Him. So I'll ask our ushers to, to come on up here. Lord, as we prepare to give to you, Lord, we come to you and say thank you, Lord, for all that you've given us. Lord, we are truly giving back to you what is rightfully yours. Lord, that, that we have the privilege of, of managing and holding on to for a short time. And Lord, we're going to give with an expectation that as you have always done, you are going to do far greater things. So Lord, as we give, place in our hearts cheerfulness. Let's fill our hearts through the power of your Holy Spirit with all the love that comes from you. Bless our offertory. 
We thank you, Lord, and praise you. In Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. This week, um, Tammy asked me if I would play guitar and sing along with the worship team. And in discussing what song to, to do for the offering, we mentioned a few. But when she mentioned As the Deer, I was taken back by the song she suggested as a song is, has a very special place in my heart. A friend and I began to read scriptures together. Back then, as we read together, God began to change in me through the word, even though I had what seemed to me that I had accepted Christ 20 years later, prior to this time. Through the reading of his word, I longed to know God more deeply, so much so I was clinging to the word for life. It began an inward change in me as well as it was shown outwardly. My friend knew the song as the deer, as she saw my deep, deep desire to seek God more in my life. Because she saw how the word was changing my life, and as she heard the song we are about to sing, she had read the line in the song, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. She decided that she would name me Doe. To this day, my name with her is Doe. It's during this time in my life, things that I had built up for myself weren't working any longer. I was hospital bound, lost, confused, and my soul hurt. He began to change things, and I further longed for his word. He was tearing down my old life so that he would build his kingdom or house in my life. My life because I was willing to allow God to grow me more into what he desires brings purpose to my life. I know of God's strength, his wanting for me to dive to self, and Jesus to live more in my life. It's about relationship rather than proving my way or the highway or even demanding God's laws onto somebody's life. It's about his love. It's about loving my neighbor as myself. Jesus, God, and the Holy Spirit is everything to me. It's all about him, Jesus. I would like to recite this scripture from my memory as I firmly believe his word. His word penetrates my heart. How blessed is the man who does not walk in the counsel of the wicked, nor stand in the path of sinners, nor sit in the seat of scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He will be like a tree firmly planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. And in whatever he does, he prospers. Let us worship the Lord with gladness and great tidings.
Great job. Fantastic. What I'd like to do now, oh, here he is. I was looking for him at his feet. Um, I'd like to welcome Pastor Ron to come, up, to come up, and he is going to speak to us for our missions moment. I'm Good morning, Grace Baptist. Good to see each and every one of you. What did I say? Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I sometimes say in the afternoon when it's morning or the evening when it's, you know, so if anybody has ever done that, please identify. But anyway. <laughs> International missions and national missions are very important to Grace Baptist Church and, and always have been. And uh, I'd like to just take a, a moment in behalf of the missions committee to to just share a little bit about the country of Haiti, because just recently we were able to send $1,000 uh, to the town of my son in reference to feeding some of the children and then also uh, replacing some of the medicines that they have there at the pharmacy. You might know that uh, Haiti is one third of the island of uh, Hispaniola, and the other two thirds of the island is the Dominican Republic. Converge actually now has five ministries, and since uh, 1988, and I know I'm giving my age away, I've had the privilege of uh, going to Haiti, uh, primarily to the, the city of Maisad, which is right in the very center of Haiti, and it's a town of about 12,000 people. When we uh, send our uh, money to uh, Haiti, it primarily goes to this uh, town of, of uh, Maisad, and uh, recently they just sent me these slides, and this represents a, a rural med medical clinic where they go out into the rural villages and uh, share some of our resources by buying medicines and, uh, and then also food, especially for the children. Next slide. So Haiti's population is about 12 million people, of which 36% of the population is under the age of 15. The literacy rate is uh, 20%, and yet uh, Christians are approximately 40%. Haiti is actually one of the, the wonders of uh, the missions since really since the 1950s that greatly responded to Christ. But Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere due to overpopulation, deforestation, and 75% of the population living on an income of $2 a day political instability, earthquakes, and tropical storms. Now add to that COVID-19. And so it's a country that's very poor. But again, you can see the mothers bringing the, the young children and uh, having a time both of worship and they're just so thankful for our sacrifice. And so you might know that 10% of our offerings every week or 10% of our annual revenue goes for international and national missions. Well, since the assassination of uh, Haiti's president, Jovenel Moes, he's a former banana exporter, so in 2021 he was assassinated, Haiti has been in chaos. But it's a country that remains in uh, political turmoil because of gang violence is ruling the streets of, of uh, the capital. Recently, uh, a short-term uh, missions uh, team of 16 people were, were held for ransom, and you probably heard about them. In the middle of the night, they were able to escape. But just to give you some other statistics, this is a UN report from 2020 on Haiti. Kidnapping has increased by 200% from the previous year. Murders have risen 20%, rapes 12%. And so it's a country that really needs our prayers. The United Nations stated in June of 2021 at the city of Port-au-Prince that there are an estimated 95 armed gangs that control large territories making up one-third of the capital. Armed gangs have stopped the city hospitals from functioning other than on their terms. And so if you brought your wife or your husband who was having a heart attack or your child that needed help, you first have to bribe, pay a bribe to the gangs, and then you're allowed into, into the hospitals. 
so which is just so sad. And a crooked judiciary refuses to prosecute those that are responsible for the attacks. And why is that? Because the judges are being paid. So in the midst of political chaos, ongoing tragedies, a failing economy, tropical storms, earthquakes, COVID-19, Grace Baptist Church has ministered to the poor and needy of my side for the last eight years sending approximately $10,000 for aid and for food. It's greatly needed. We need to continue. And thanks. Times I didn't turn it on this time. But I think even as we, um, we we look today at what we're doing as a church, and as I believe everybody knows, but I, I do want to remind that after church will be for church members, but everybody's welcome to stay. We're going to vote on our new budget, and even with the um, even with the budget constraints that you know, the budget is reflecting the continue to give to missions what we've been giving. And I think that's very important. And I think that's part of, you know, what's, what's being presented today too. And, and even as we, we put into our offertory today, and maybe as you give to missions, and as maybe as you, you know, donate specifically to missions and you give, we think about what we've been able to do to help. And we're gonna expect God to continue to do great things. I'm just amazed at the, the 40% of the country that is Christian, even in the midst of that poverty, of that struggle, of, of, of what is being dealt with in that country, the faithfulness of Christ and the faithfulness of the people there to continue to seek Him. So, thank you for that, Pastor Ron. And as we open a prayer, we're going to pray for that. And as, um, as, we, as we call on God and look at prayerfulness, um, I was praying last night, I know uh, my wife and I were praying for a specific person and uh, we got a call late last night that um, somebody had taken a tumble and we were concerned and we prayed and was praying for this morning and, and Sue's here so yeah. praise God for that that we had a rough night in the hospital but you know God we need to call on God more and more in everything that we do and next Sunday at 6 o'clock from 6 to 7 we're going to have here an hour of prayer and any of you who came last time to that hour of prayer, I don't remember who it was who said to me, but we got toward the end and said, it's been an hour? It, it just, time just flew by. We worshiped, shared scripture, we prayed together, we prayed silently. It was just a wonderful time. And I believe that we need to be in continuous prayer for our church, for our families, for ourselves, for our communities, for the world, for the, the people of Haiti, the people we support, the people of Ukraine. So there's so much that we have to pray for, but yet we have so much to be thankful for, don't we? Is that we have a Savior who loves us and is perfect in every way. I'm going to open us in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you that we're here this morning. And again, Lord, we just come to you knowing that you are King, that you are Lord, that you are God. And Lord, even as we we lifted Sue Capros up in prayer last night to you, and then here she is, Lord. And Lord, we ask for for all who are here who need a who need healing and a restoration of their of the physical. Lord, we understand that you clearly can do that, Lord. You you also do a great restoration spiritually in us of changing and mending our hearts, Lord. As we heard as we heard Donna Godbout's testimony, Lord, it was about you changing her, Lord, and that's what kept. St jumping out at me, Lord. Even as I thought about that, you changed her, Lord. You have changed all of us, and we thank you for that. And Lord, as we're challenged, maybe each time we look into your word, as we're challenged this morning, Lord, continue that great change so that the fruits that come from us reflect the salvation and the perfection that is in you. 
We love you, Lord. We praise you. And Jesus, in your name we pray. Amen. So this has been a, a short two-week series on resurrection power. Oh, we like the resurrection. Without the resurrection, there is no Christianity. There is no life. And without the power that comes from what God has done in His perfect plan, and the fact that Jesus has that power and came from heaven to be with us. You know, because, well, I know that. And we've been working our way through John, and I keep reiterating that John's Gospel is both evangelistic and apologetic. It teaches us to go, and it teaches us to understand and be able to defend our faith. And John set out as he wrote this to say that Jesus is God, the deity, the power, the divinity. You know, and if we, if we forget that, if we don't focus on that, we miss out on all that Jesus has to offer. And I know that today, even as we're here, I know that some of our minds are moving about 40 minutes from now and thinking about we're going to vote on our church budget. You know what? Set that aside. Focus on God's Word. Focus on who Jesus is. Focus on how much. What a wonderful way that it was that, that Donna started off. So we're giving a testimony because you know what? Every single one of us has been there, has been broken, has been a sinner bound for hell. That's the truth. But with the love of Christ in us, we are saints bound for an eternity in heaven with Christ. And isn't that what we want, not only for ourselves, but for every person that we encounter in this world? We're going to be in John 5, 27 through 29. If you have your Bibles, you can follow along. It'll be on the screen, or we have uh, the few Bibles right in front of you. And he gave him authority to execute judgment. Because He is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear His voice and will come forth. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Oh. Jesus speaks and challenges. Because you know what? The reality of it is, not one of us really wants to hear about the judgment of sinners that go to hell. But that's a reality because that's what Jesus tells us and that's what His Word tells us. But the hope we have in Jesus Christ changes everything. And again, I've been saying this because as I, as I talk to people, and as I, you know, even as I talk with other pastors, I, there's, a, there's a couple other pastors in, in our group, and we're, they're also teaching through the Gospel of John. And it was always a challenge to start when you get to the Gospel of John, because well, everybody say, I know that. You know, well, we're, you know, we're a church of saved people. I've been, I've been in church for 30 years. Do you know Jesus? Do you know that Jesus is God? Do we understand the divinity of God? Do we understand that He is the one to judge? So it's challenging. So we have to look at it. It's evangelistic. Yes, there's people who need to hear. We all need to hear. But there's people who have to know how to defend and how to develop our faith and how to grow our relationship. And that's what Jesus is getting at this morning. Because in any story, realize there's an antagonist and a protagonist. If you read any book... If you look at any history, you see antagonism and protagonism. I mean, that makes a good story, right? You have the good guy and the bad guy. You know, the superhero movies are huge. There's a good guy and there's a bad guy. There's Batman and then there's the bad guys. There's Superman. Superman and then there's the bad guys. There's um, Spider-Man. 
<laughs> we get it, yeah, there's all these different superheroes. I don't know why you said, but that's all right. And some of, the, some of our superheroes we named, they showed our age. But there's good, there's good and there's bad, and that's the way. Even as I'm, I'm reading right now, I'm reading a, a book about Ulysses S. Grant. Ulysses S. Grant, a good guy. And there's a lot of bad guys. Ulysses S. Grant, fighting for freedom. Fighting to keep the country together. Yeah, Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a good guy. He was fighting the evil of slavery, as was Ulysses S. Grant. You know, but we, even as we look at God's Word, God's Word lines up antagonist and protagonist. Good guy, bad guy. He says, those who are born again lead a different life. And that's where Jesus is working to today when he talks about judgment. He says good deeds and evil deeds. That those who are born again lead a different life. John 8, 12. See, we walk in his light. John 14, verse 15. In obedience to him. John 15, we looked at, uh, you know, verses 5 through 7, abiding in Him. See, so we say when you're born again, when you come to know Jesus, when you come to know me, as He's saying here, there will be good deeds. If you don't know me, there won't be good deeds. They'll just be evil deeds. Are evil deeds sins of omission? I think that's something that we have to wrestle with. You know, I somebody commented last week, you're going to work any bookstores into your sermon this week. And I said, no, no bookstores. I said, but I am going to work this in. And I told him. I remember that, the, well, it's still out there, the Hebrew National Company. They make great hot dogs, good smoked sausages, different things like that that are really good. What's their slogan? We answer to a higher authority. <laughs> They're still not healthy. But Hebrew National, I come they answer to a higher authority. Referencing God. And I think the challenge is this morning as Jesus presents judgment, good deeds, evil deeds. There is going to be judgment. We're all going to be called out of the tomb. And bodies. It just matters where you spend eternity. So the question is, as Hebrew National says, they answer to a higher authority. Are we answering to that higher authority? Because as John 3.36 tells us, we need to figure this out. He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Somebody asked me if they... Who doesn't come here. I, he works over at Stop and Shop, friend. So what kind of sermons tomorrow? And I said, fire and brimstone. I said, no, not really. I said, but it is about judgment. He said, oh, okay. We'll talk about him in a little bit, but you know what? Damnation is due solely to the rejection of the Son. And that's what Jesus is getting said. And that gets us into the main idea because really we don't like to know this. I don't want to talk about hell. I want to talk about good things. I want my ears tickled. I want everything to be happy. I just want to hear all that God is love. Yes, God is love. But the reality is in that love, he's working on our hearts to change. Again, anybody who heard Donna speak... The Lord was working on your heart to change it. Don't we want to be changed? And you know what? He's not done changing us. Praise God for that, right? So we look at the main idea. The one who was judged for our sin while on the cross is the one qualified to judge us. And that's what Jesus is saying. The deity of Christ, Jesus, is God. We have to understand that. We live in that. We want to grow in that. And last week, we looked at the first prerogative 
of God. Because we know as Jesus claimed his equality with God, claiming that he was God, he was upsetting people. Oh, who, who are you? Because he was making clear these claims. He was claiming prerogatives that lie solely with God. And as he did that, Jesus said, I am God. Last week, he talked about life. Life is in me. He said, I give life. We talk about he raises from the dead. He restores from the broken. He restores us. And every time we saw about restoration of life, we saw the word of God speak. Today, he's, he's laying out another prerogative for us. A truth. We have moved from the life in himself, the life that's in, in Jesus, to the authority to execute judgment. I like that he has life in himself. That's much better for me to stay with. But Jesus has the authority to execute judgment. But, he certainly is willing to do a great work in us to change us so that we may have eternity with Him. These three verses, 27 through 29, they present the evidence to us. And even as we see in verse 27, and He gave Him authority to execute judgment because He is the Son of Man. And even as we we see that with us in the Son of Man. This is the most common way in which Jesus would refer to Himself. 88 times through the Gospels, He uses the term to describe Himself the Son of Man. And the Son of Man often throws us off. We even have one of our youth who, He likes to grill us. He likes to grill you, doesn't He, John? He likes, because He wants to get to the bottom of this. We love that kid. But the Son of Man, the most common way in which Jesus refers to Himself, and it's derived from the book of Daniel, from the Messianic description that we see there. The authority of Jesus comes from Him being the Son of Man. And we're going to look first, and we see in, in Daniel 7.13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a Son of Man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And we see there that reference to the Son of Man. And we have to start to develop. All right, well, who is this? Who is this pointing to? And we see it pointing to Jesus. Because I just want you to understand the evidence before we start getting into the judgment. Because even as we look, we start thinking about Jesus. He's the Son of Man. He's before the Ancient of Days. He's in heaven. Who is he? We look down in Hebrews 4.15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. See, see we have this, this wonderful picture of the messianic vision that Daniel was given of the Savior of the world. Yet as we look at the author of Hebrews laying out, that very same Savior of the world came to be with us and understands the pain, understands everything that we go through. Because He was God, He was man, yet He never sinned. See, so this is who that Son of Man is. This is how Jesus is given the judgment. You say, well, what does this mean? And then we go back to Daniel 7, 14. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. And his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is the one, the only one, who is allowed to judge us. 
the presentation of the evidence of who Jesus is and the power that comes with that. The expectation, shall we say, that comes with that. Because Jesus is about to deliver in verse 29, oh, an expectation based on who he is. But now we see in verse 28, as we continue and look at John. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear his voice. Marveling. Oh. Don't marvel. What happens when we marvel at something like that? Oh, yeah. We sort of come to a, a standstill. A place of complacency. A place that we marvel on. Maybe the marvels of what has been. The marvels of my life is great. The marvels of, I have everything I need. And it brings us to a place of, I'm perfectly fine just where I am. Often as we marvel, we tend to get stuck. And we don't move. Ah, oh, that's nice. No, I don't want to change. I don't want to do anything different. In Acts 2.12, we covered this, we did a review on Wednesday night as, as we looked at the people because they marveled. They marveled in 2.12 in great perplexity and amazement at what was happening all around them. They marveled at the work of God and then they began mocking God. They didn't get on board with who He was. They didn't get on board with the call that Jesus had placed on their lives. You will receive the power and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the remotest part of the earth. Oh, I'm just marveling. If we're going to stand in awe of the presence of God, of Jesus, who is the judge, we need to move forward. We need to be challenged. We need to be both evangelistic and apologetic. We need to, we need to learn to defend who Jesus is. He's God. So that we can share. Say, no, I don't want to evangelize. Do you have somebody in your life who doesn't know Jesus? Do you have, does anybody have somebody in their life who doesn't know Jesus? Yes. 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 What did Jesus say will happen? You know the answer. That's why we want to be apologetic. We want to learn to defend our faith, to go and say, I want to tell you who Jesus is. This is the Messiah. This is the one who saved me and changed me. We're doing in our in our Wednesday night Bible study. We had two people stand up two weeks ago, and in two minutes, give your testimony because you just might have those two minutes to do it. Right? I'm looking at a couple of folks who did that. It was wonderful. But if we just marvel, as Jesus says, do not marvel at that. Do not marvel the fact that I'm saying, oh, Jesus is God. Oh, that's marvelous. You have to have some action. Theologian David Peterson said, The miraculous is not self-authenticating, nor does it inevitably and uniformly convince. Oh, that's marvelous. What are you looking at? Oh, I'm just looking at Jesus. It's wonderful. We have to do more with the marvel. We have to take the action. There needs to be fruit. I told you this would be challenging today. But that's good. We have a lot of people here. And that's good because we all need to be challenged. We all need to get out into the world and be challenged and bring this information to a world that needs to know it. John's Gospel is evangelistic and apologetic. No, I don't like the evangelistic part. Just tell me about Jesus. I know Jesus is God, so we can skip over this and get to the end. No, we have to look at it. It's challenging. Because then, in this very verse in 28, as we, as we still see up there, it says, an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs. This is getting the point. Who is going to be judged? Everybody. Who's in the tombs? Everybody. I just made a great joke with somebody, and I told him he could take this joke if he needed it. He said, good to see you. And I said, better to be seen than viewed. I'm allowing that joke to be used. 
truth is a resurrection occurs for everyone. And even as we go back and we see in, in Daniel 12, Now at that time, Michael, the great prince who stands guard over the sons of your people, will arise, and there will be a time of distress such as never occurred since there was a nation until that time. And at that time, your people, everyone who was found written in the book, will be rescued. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but the others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. There's going to be a resurrection for everybody and a judgment. It just depends on where do you spend the eternity. And then we get to that part of verse 28. It says, All who are in the tombs will hear His voice. The hearing of Christ in our lives presents precisely the perfect, sovereign command of Christ to us. You're hearing the Word of God this morning. Did you spend time in God's Word on your own? Did you pray and, and the Holy Spirit spoke to you? You're hearing precisely the commands of God. But are we acting on that? Because if we're hearing the commands of God, there we go, and we marvel, whoa, that's nice. I, I, I see what God is telling His people. I, I hear that. Oh, I heard that wonderful, I heard that wonderful man, preacher, I thought it was what he said, David Jeremiah. Wonderful preacher. I heard David Jeremiah on TV, and he was, he was clearly speaking the Word of God. I'm glad you heard it, but what have we done? We need to be challenged. We need to get out there and do. Are we acting on that? Are we living in that saving faith? I said to my friend at a stop and shop yesterday. And he said, well, what, what, give me something. Give me something. Oh, okay. I had a chance to present them the gospel. But he was really hurt and baffled by church. I gotta go to church to go to heaven. I said, no. And he, he, he stopped. And I said, going to church doesn't make anybody a Christian, a believer in Christ. Going to church doesn't get anybody to heaven any more than I said, if you go stand in the produce cooler in the back of the stopping shop, then you become a bunch of broccoli. <laughs> we have to see that. We have to be shown. Because Jesus is talking about good deeds and evil deeds. As we get into the last verse, I'm not talking about works salvation. Nobody get ready to say, I'm going to email him. He's a heretic. I'm not talking about works salvation. Philippians 3, 10 and 11. To know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being conformed to His death in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Paul is saying, I have to know all about Jesus. I have to live in what He wants. I have to be challenged in the salvation that He's given me to act in a way. There needs to be fruits. There needs to be fruits. He was in us all things. Can we be in Him with all things? Can we? Verse 29. And will come forth those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Oh, there it is. Salvation and saving faith. It's very clear. All will come forth to be judged. Now Jesus isn't going to say, you went to church every, every week. You've been going to church every week for 40 years. You're in 
Because what would that be? That would be work of salvation, wouldn't it? You know, I, I, I got to say, you know, Jesus isn't going to say, well, you gave 500 bucks every month. Wow, you gave, you gave over your 10%. You're in. And maybe every time he did, he could slam the envelope in the basket or were bitter about something. Or he said, they're lucky I give. That doesn't get you in. I say magic words. I said magic prayers. I said, I said the same prayer every day for 30 years. That doesn't get you in. We have to see that right now. We get ourselves to a moment of decision. All are coming forth to be judged. And we're at a place of decision. Romans 2. 6 through 8. God, who will, who God will render to each person according to his deeds. To those who by perseverance in doing good seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. But to those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath, and indignation. Decision time has presented itself. Again, we're not talking about works of salvation. There is nothing that any of us can do to get into heaven. Damnation is when we choose everything else except for Jesus. So the question is, I've been coming to church for 30 years, I don't like what you're saying. I don't like it either. But I don't want to see anybody spend eternity in hell. Because as I talk and I sit with other pastors from this city of Bristol, as I sit with Dustin from Liberty, as I sit with Jason from Hillside, as we talk, as I sit with Todd from the bridge, all Bible-believing churches, all faithful men. And order it always comes back to how are we going to reach the lost? And what are we going to do to grow the faith in our church? We're called to know Jesus as Lord, to be disciples who make disciples, make Jesus the Lord of our life, and bring his message. Say, well, no. It's about getting people to come to church. No, it's about reaching the lost for Christ. And I often fear that even in our own faith, maybe even in our own life, we miss out on something. I will ask you, why is the gate narrow and the road of destruction broad? Why are we commanded to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Why are we told that every knee will bow? Time and time again we're told this. God's Word. Because God's Word is challenging the faithful. God's Word is challenging maybe some of us this morning. God may be challenging some of us this decision time have I been coming to church for 30 years and I don't really know Jesus? Why does God's Word say the gate is narrow and the road is broad if I shouldn't be thinking that, if we shouldn't be challenged this morning? Why are we commanded to work out our salvation with fear and trembling? Why are we told that every knee shall bow? John's going to wrestle with that one, and he's been, as he preaches next week on that. We're not talking about doing good works to get into heaven. Jesus very clearly said, evil deeds and good deeds. Good deeds which reflect our salvation in him 
evil deeds which reflect our choice not to follow Him. We understand salvation is the work of God. Galatians 2.16, we are justified by Christ. We said the one who was judged for our sins on the cross, He justified us by what He did on the cross. His blood was poured out. We are saved if we believe in Him. But we also see, we look at Matthew 6.44, good works are the evidence of of God's salvific work in our lives. And that is what Jesus addressed here. The good deeds. If there's no fruit, what good is the tree? Didn't Jesus show us that? Oh, that's not what it meant. I mean, there's just no fruit on the tree tree had no life. The tree will wither and die. Salvation is by faith alone. But not a faith that is alone. Saving faith expresses itself in a loving response to the practical needs of others. Let me read God's word again. did the good deeds to a resurrection of life, those who committed the evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. I believe, as the secular world likes to say, this is a true come to Jesus moment. It's decision time. Do the works that I do reflect the salvific work, the salvation that Jesus has given to me? Or do the works that I do reflect just what I want? There's a decision for any of us to make today. If you don't know Jesus, today's the day you need to come to know Jesus. And make Him the Lord in your life. And He's here and present for you. If you've been playing the game, we've talked about the neutral zone in our life. We talked about the commitment to those in our lives who we haven't treated right. We've talked about dancing back and forth over the line. But Jesus brings it all home today. When he said, do the deeds in your life reflect the salvation you have in me? We're saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Something needs to come from the faith. I'll ask you, here's our two questions before we pray. Will we submit everything to the authority of Jesus Christ? Everything. Wants, needs, desires, preferences, everything. I know that prayer brings me to my knees. Am I willing to bring every area under, every area in my life under the absolute control and authority of Jesus Christ? Do my deeds reflect the work of Jesus? Hard question with the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. Questions that can be answered and hearts that can be changed. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Lord, your word is perfect. Lord, as we look at your word, we're challenged by the hard things. Lord, we, we rejoice at the wonderful things. We rejoice at the change and the things that you have done in our life that are so good. Lord, any change for the good in our life is because of you. We can't earn salvation. We can't earn your love. 
You did everything on the cross. But Lord, as believers in Christ, it's more than just coming to church. Lord, and I would just ask that you touch each and every one of our hearts. Lord, it's about you. It's about being challenged by you. It's about looking at you. And Lord, it's about getting down to business with you to do the dirty work that needs to be done in our lives sometimes. The things that hurt. But Lord, but the glory that we will see one day, nothing can surpass that. Not, we can't even imagine what we will find with you one day. So Lord, let us be challenged today. Let us walk out saying, what is that area, Lord, in my heart that needs to come under your authority? We love you, Lord. We thank you. We give you all the glory. And Jesus, it's in your name that we pray. Amen. Amen. But you just stand one last time. About God being the authority, which means that being the authority, if we know Him today, He is our Father, and that makes us His children. So this last song that we're singing, I told these ladies up here, sing it with authority because you are a child of God. So I'd like to hear everybody, not only us singing to you, but I want to hear the voices of the congregation singing back to us and sing it with, with authority that you are a child of God and you can claim that today if you know him.
the last scripture. If you're new here or if you've been coming for a few weeks, step on over to the, the Welcome Center. We have a little gift for you. We'd like to give you something. So we'll be over there. I believe Keith will be over there and uh, can answer any questions. And we, we just love having you here. Thank you for coming this morning. I'm going to close us in 2 Thessalonians 2, 16 and 17. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal comfort and good hope by grace, comfort and strengthen your hearts in every good work and word. And everybody says, Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your weekend.